All right, all right, all done. That's enough. That's all the time I can give to other people today. All right, so fair warning, Gary, one of our elders, preached last Sunday, so you know what that means. I got like at least three sermons in the hopper ready to go for this week, so get excited. We'll be able to, what? We have plenty of time. Come on. The meeting doesn't start till noon. We got a full hour. All right, listen up. Hey. So, so here's why I had you write down some questions. Twofold, because I'm going to ask you on your way out to put them in the bins. Don't write your name on them or anything. But I'd love to read through them. It'd be like a total blessing for me as a pastor. And in our section of Paul's letter that we are reading right now, Paul has just received a letter from Corinth asking a bunch of questions. And in chapter 7, Paul's going systematically through responding to the questions that they've asked him. So, so what we're talking about isn't just Paul weirdly giving them advice. They asked him a bunch of questions, and Paul, in our pastor, is going to work his way piece by piece through a bunch of things that they're wondering about, really focused on relationships. And so two weeks ago, we started chapter 7, and we talked about physical affection between a husband and a wife. Uh, and if you're curious about that and uh, want to watch it alone instead of with a group of people, you can go back online and take a look at that one. But, but, but now Paul's going to delve into a whole new round of questions that they've asked him about relationships. And we're going to start today in a little bit of a different way. So if you turn your sermon notes over, I gave you an outline of our passage Right, Because this is one of those weeks where there's a bunch of little things we can talk through. But I want to focus on the bigger picture that Paul's giving them right now. So, so I want to quickly talk through, I want to talk us through what Paul's going to do in response to their questions. So the first question that they ask is, is how do we navigate right, what it means to follow Jesus in the midst of a culture that says you should divorce whenever it feels right for you? Right? And they're trying to figure out, as followers of Jesus, how do we follow Jesus in the midst of a culture that seems to say something different than Jesus? And they, they send him this question first, trying to figure out, how does this work for followers of Jesus when they're married together? How do they reconcile those moments? Right? And in there, we're going we're gonna to talk through this in a bit. Um, this is not going to be an extensive sermon talking about divorce. We've had two sermons in the last three years where we've done a deep dive into what Scripture says about that, one from Matthew and one from from Malachi. So if you're looking for that, great. You can go back online and look at that. Today, Paul's going to be using this example to teach us something else. Then Paul's going to go in and he's going to answer their second question about how do we navigate some of these marriage dynamics when one person's a follower of Jesus and one person isn't? Is that sometimes complicated in a relationship? On a scale from one to yes, absolutely it is. Right? And they're trying to figure out, hey, they wanted to follow Jesus with their whole heart. And here, Paul's going to unveil a bit about how to go about that. And then Paul's going to give some hope of why to follow Jesus. Like why it's worth sticking through even if it's hard. Why it's worth persevering. Because Paul says there might be something greater at the end. And then at the end, Paul's going to give us some framework that I think is going to where, where his really his heart for answering all this question, these questions are. So you've got the outline there. We're going to blast through this. I'm super excited. So let's jump in. So real quick as we jump in, for those who weren't here in chapter 5, where we kind of started working through this whole relationship section from chapter 5 to 7, I, I want to give you a little bit of a picture. I don't know how many, raise your hand if you've been to Corinth before. All right, one person. Great, awesome. All right, how many of you been to Corinth 2,000 years ago? All right, like zero of us, myself included. So I want to tell you a bit about what marriage was like in that time so that as we enter in, we have some context because as a church, we say all the time, context matters, right? Always and forever. And this is one of those moments. So Paul spoke the words that we're going to work through into a culture and a moment that had made a mess of marriage, singleness, and romantic relationships. There are norms around what is expected of you in marriage and in singleness. And relationship dynamics were so broken, heartbreaking, and messy. Kind of like another place that I've been to called All World and Our Moment. So I want to share with you a common phrase that was said in Corinth. We have this written down in extra biblical material from the time. This is what they would say as kind of a guiding principle for marriage and devotion to one another in marriage. Here's what it says. Mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure. 
concubines for the daily care of the body, but wives to bear us legitimate children. How many people want to sign up for that marriage covenant? How many people find that to be grotesquely horrific and awful? I hope you do, because it should turn your stomach. And I want you to know why Paul is teasing through something that feels weird, that might feel a little foreign for him to spend so much time on. It's because that's the cultural norms and the times and in the place that these followers of Jesus are trying to figure out how do they pursue and follow Jesus in the midst of these being the cultural, right, and inherited picture. And I'm going to say that in every culture, at every time, there are unique difficulties, sins, and brokenness that every generation of people tolerate. Did you guys know that? Like, that, that if you're under 20, did you know that in 20 years, they're going to look back at you, and they're going to be like, how could they have done that? No, I'm serious. Like, every generation, this happens. And in Corinth, in particular, the picture and this covenantal picture of marriage was so broken. And so was their picture of what singleness looked like. And so in light of that, Paul's going to spend a good chunk of this letter and this section helping them understand, right, as good missionaries. I'm going to just do one quick aside. I was a missionary for a decade. So important for us to know that. Did you know that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a missionary? Did you know that? Right? That's your purpose. So as missionaries, we were trained to do three things when we enter a culture and try to share the gospel. Some things about the culture we just receive because they're good. Does that make sense? In every culture all around the world, you can find some good things about it. Right? So there are some things you walk and you're like, that's great. Right? There are some things that you reject because they're just objectively horrible and evil. Does that make sense? Like slavery in the United States 150 years ago, we just reject that right? We don't receive that. That's just evil, terrible thing, right? And all around the world, right, there are things in every culture and time that you receive, some that you reject, and then others that you redeem. And we're going to see Paul do all three of those things. And I'm going to encourage you, I'm not going to point them out, but I'm going to tell you, Paul's going to do all three of those things in our passage. At some point, he's going to redeem something. At some point, he's going to receive something, right? And at some point, he's going to reject something, because it's objectively evil and broken. So we're going to jump into our passage. If you join with me, we're going to start in chapter 7, verse 10. I'm going to pray for us. And my hope and prayer is that we encounter God in a meaningful and transformational way as we open his word. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful for Paul. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters in Corinth. Lord, and the messiness of their life. Lord, and by your grace, your gift of helping us learn from them. Lord, we pray and ask today that as we spend time studying your word and opening up, that you would speak to each of our hearts, that we might be confident in who you are and what you've done. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hear the word of the Lord in verse 10. Paul says this. He's addressing first. Remember, you have your outline. I'm not going to navigate us through. You've got your outline of where we're going to be. Paul starts out with this. To the married, I give this challenge. Not I, but who? The but the Lord. Okay, here's what he's saying. So Paul uses this turn of phrase a bunch of times in his letters. Right? And here's what it means. Paul says... Okay, I'm just going to read my notes. Paul is saying that Jesus has already answered the question that they sent him. Right? Sometimes in life, we ask a question of Scripture, and is it a little bit unclear what the answer is? The answer is absolutely yes. Sometimes we ask a question of Scripture because we just don't want to follow it, and we want to find a way to get around it. Anyone else other than me done that before? A hundred percent. This is one of those moments. He's like, hey, you don't even need my opinion on this. Jesus already said what it meant to follow him in this area. Paul spent a year and a half planning this church. He knows they've heard it. There's manuscripts of Mark floating around at this point when this letter is read. They have access to the gospels at this point. And in Mark, Jesus clearly teaches what to say. So Paul in this, he's like, hey, I'm giving you a clear answer because Jesus clearly answered this first one. So that's, that'll be clear. So here's what he says. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Paul says that a Christian should remain married and not be divorced from their spouse. Unless it's for reasons... Listen, listen, I know there's like three of you saying, what about this? Just trust me, we'll get to hear the whole thing. Just, just wait, right? Like they should not be divorced from their spouse, right? Like 
Paul says Jesus' intent for marriage is what? Man, woman, covenantal marriage until death do us part. Right? That's God's plan for marriage. I'm telling you that was not the plan that they inherited from their culture. Right? Divorce was easy. It was single party consent divorce for the Greek people. Right? And the Jewish people in Corinth who were part of the diaspora could just write a note, hand it to their wives, the husbands could, and the wife had to leave the house. Right? Like, it was so broken. And Paul's like, hey, guess what? This one's not complicated. You can't just leave them if you feel like it. You can't just leave them if they displease you. You can't just leave them because you lost the feels. Raise your hand if you've been married more than 20 years. Does it feel like the first day on year 30? Does it feel like that first day one of just infatuated love? Are you still infatuatingly in love with your spouse on year 30? Yeah, no, never dad, just stop. <laughs> Right, so Paul's just saying, hey, Jesus already said, if you're married, stay very married. And he plainly taught this in the gospel. And God's best command is to stay married. And I, I want to encourage you, if you'd like to hear more of a more nuanced talk, I did two 40-minute sermons, or 45-minute, one of them, on this very topic, right? So one from Malachi 5, Malachi 2 and one from Matthew 5. I'll link them on Facebook this week if you want a deep dive. I did all the nuanced reasons like, yes, are there some other reasons to divorce other than infidelity, right? A spouse. Yeah, I, I unpacked all that there. I'm not unpacking that today. So just know, right, that resource is there for those of you who want a deeper dive on that. So the first question, he's like, hey, this is really easy. Jesus said, no, you can't divorce them if you just don't like them, right? And, and so, so I, I summed it up this way. Right? Our feelings, desires, or happiness was then, and I'm going to say is now, a culturally acceptable reason to divorce. Have you, it, do, we, do we agree on this? I'm not feeling it. I've fallen out of love with them, right? God's got someone else for me, right? You're no longer the person for me. You guys all heard that before, right? Absolutely, right? right? But I'm going to tell you as followers of Jesus, those reasons are unacceptable, reasons to divorce someone. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that, that, that we can only look to Jesus for guidance on that. Does that make sense? All right, first question. It was really easy, right? So next, Paul answers the same question they asked. They're like, okay, so the first question they asked was, how do we do that as married people when both people are followers of Jesus? The second one, they're asking for one person to follow of Jesus, the other person isn't. So here's what he says in verse 12 and 13. To the rest, being all the rest of the married people who both spouses aren't followers of Jesus, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Right? And here, the turn of phrase is slightly different. The first time says, the Lord says, not I, right? Because Jesus made it clear. Did you know that Jesus didn't talk about this very specific scenario of how to navigate a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever in the Gospels? Jesus didn't say that explicitly. So what Paul's doing is he's like, hey, here's what Jesus teaches about marriage. Jesus loves marriage. Jesus is for marriage. Who created marriage? God created marriage in the garden, right? He, he, he does his first marriage covenant with Adam and Eve. And we worship a God that loves marriage. And Paul's giving this pastoral advice concerning marriage because Jesus doesn't explicitly say what to do. But his teachings clearly inferred by Jesus' New Testament teachings about marriage and divorce. So Paul's counsel is simple. is Christians should remain married unless the person who, has, who is not yet a follower of Jesus doesn't want to stay with them. Does that make sense? Like it's very simple. It's not complicated. But, but sometimes when things are hard... When your kids were little and you asked them to do something and they were curious or didn't want to do it, what do they ask you? Wow. Why? Anyone else's kids did that? It's definitely not irritating when you ask them. I definitely never did that. I was a perfectly obedient child my whole life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but listen up. But this time, listen, I love, right? So Paul gives this call. call. Can I just say, is it hard to stay in a really unhappy marriage? Yes. If your spouse is a jerk, is it hard to stay married to them? Yeah. 
Like if there are just, again, if they're just unkind to you, is it hard, right? Yes, Paul's not asking them to do something simple. So for this one, he says, hey, I'm gonna explain why this is such a big deal for us to get right. So here's what he says. Let's pick it up in verse 14. He gives them the why. He says, here's why. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether to save your wife? Here's what Paul's saying. Paul says faithfulness to your marriage covenant, even if it's hard, complicated, or messy, to an unbelieving spouse may be part of their path to salvation and rescue for Jesus. Last week, Gary who is just an incredibly gifted Bible teacher. And I don't know how, how much you guys know how blessed you are to have multiple people come up here and open God's word. He taught us out of Luke 10. And, and I, I'm gonna steal from Gary a bit to answer this. Here's what it says if you wanna join me. Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, the lawyer stood up to put him being Jesus to the test. And he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. You want a prize? No, he says you have answered correctly. So go and do likewise. God's calling the Corinthians here to do the same. He's calling them to love people and to love God with the same intensity and passion that they would want for themselves, right? In their position of knowing and following Jesus. And if they weren't there, would they deeply want their spouse to share the gospel with them? They would want to share that good news. And and Paul's saying that, hey, there's a chance that if you stick around, your spouse and your children may come to know Jesus. Is he saying your marriage is going to be super fun if you stick around? Is he saying it's going to be pleasant? Is he promised that it's all going to work out how you planned at the end? Absolutely not. But he says the way of Jesus, can I just tell you, it's always good. And there's often suffering, but I'm going to tell you, have you found a good and wonderful and a beautiful thing in life that did not cause you to suffer a bit? I've yet to find one. I found pleasurable things that did not cause me to suffer for them, but no truly good thing that I treasure comes without a cost. And this is one of those moments. He said, yes, it's hard, right? You take the shot in the chest, but if you stay and if you love, even when it's hard, Right? There's hope of your children and your spouse hearing the good news and receiving it and following Jesus. He's calling them to love their spouse and children as they do themselves. God's not, this is not like an, uh, please don't read this passage out of context, right? It's not like the spouse is saved because his, their spouse, other spouse is. It's that you have an opportunity to live and be in that house and share God's good news in word and deed day by day. And Paul continues on to what I believe is the most important thing and the whole climax and pinnacle that this whole passage is hinging on. And to understand what Paul's building here, we need to understand this next verse. So let's jump in if you join me. Chapter 7, verse 17. Here's what Paul says. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. I'm reading it one more time. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule 
in all the churches. Right? This is the whole good news of this. You can go ahead and give me that next, that next quote. All right. As I was going through commentaries, I, I ran across this, and it's just like too good. We're going to spend a little time reading and talking about this because I think he summarizes so beautifully what Paul's articulating. He says this, No matter what your station, married, single, divorced, widowed, remarried, whatever, God can work in your life Instead of thinking that you can or will walk for the Lord when your station changes, walk for the Lord in the place you are right now. Here's what Paul's saying. Often we think that something in our circumstances has to change in order for God to use us. Those who are over 60, has your life ever been perfectly together? Does it get perfectly together at some point and not complicated? What about those of you who are 50s? Is your life perfectly complicated? Kids are out of the house, maybe, like, things are getting less complicated. No? 40s. Oh, I'm not in my 40s. I'm not. 30s. Still, com- is it easy in the 30s? Uh, it's not easy, but yeah, you develop some wisdom over years, yes? Yeah, you tend to not fall face first in the same pothole for the 50th time. Hopefully by 50. But what he's saying is that, that I'm going to say that often as people, we think, hey, in order for us to change, our circumstance needs to change. I'm going to tell you there will always be something in your life that makes you think you're unable, unwilling, or disqualified from God to use you. You will never have a perfect, sinless season of your life. Your family will never always be perfectly healthy. Right? Finances won't always be perfect, but we live with this deluded thought that in order for God to use us, we have to bat a thousand. Base Tom, 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 who, who had the highest batting average in baseball ever? Ted Williams. Did he, did he bat 800? 700? 600? 500? In the 400s? Failed six out of ten, greatest baseball player ever. Greatest hitter. Barry Bonds is the best baseball player ever. If you're curious, we can, we can talk about that another time. Steroids are amazing. <laughs> so good, man. Anyway, sorry, that's not on the notes. But, but, but listen, I, I need us to understand this. Or you and I will never get to where God wants us to be. It's never all going to line up perfectly. I don't care what the weird astrological thing does, like the planets are aligned, like everything. works. Life does not work that way. It never does. And the second it's there, it's gone, for, it's gone in a moment. It's like smoke in front of you. So, so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to send you back into those same groups that you allegedly talked with earlier on. And I'm going to ask, why do, I'm, I'm going to ask you to wrestle with, I'm going to argue that I think this is good news. Right? That in order for God to use us, we don't have to be perfect and neither do our circumstances. I want you to just spend a couple minutes. No, I'll give you like 90 seconds. Why do you think this might be good news? And I'm going to ask, have you found this to be true in your own life or not? Does that make sense? Have you found it to be true that God could still use you when it's not perfect? I might even argue that when it's a little rougher, God uses us in unique ways, but we'll get to that in a second. So on your market set, Awkwardly Talk, you got 90 seconds, and then you want to put that music back on because that was, I was loving that so much. <laughs> All right, come on, head of Deacon Team, slide over. Let's go, go talk with someone. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, you guys can finish those conversations after church. There you go. Now you got something to talk about afterwards. You don't have to awkwardly stare. All right, I want to name some things that I would say we often feel like disqualify us. And I, I want to name those things that as we jump into this next section, um, and I ask us to do something a little more complicated, that we might be, be, be free to walk in. Be careful to believe that if just your circumstances were a little different, that your life would be better and you could more follow Jesus. If you're married and it's hard, welcome to marriage. <laughs> if you're single and it's hard, welcome to life. If you're young and feel like you don't know what to do next, welcome to everyone who's walked before you, who just took a risk and tried something. If you're more seasoned, remember that there are people in need of knowing what paths to take in this life, even if you've tried all the bad ones. If you're wounded, remember that there are other people in need of healing. If you're weak, know that Jesus said that there to find weak, to strengthen his kingdom, it requires us to know we're weak first. For those of you who do not have hope, know that we worship a God who seeks out to bring hope for people. Listen, listen. For those of you who feel trapped in addiction, know that there's hope for freedom and that the path to freedom needs a friend. For those of you who walk in isolation and darkness, know that there's light and hope and a community to walk with you. Those of you who trip over your words, know that people won't believe you just because it's slick. Those of you who are afraid to talk to strangers, welcome to even the extrovert's life. I just, I could spend an hour listing all the reasons that we disqualify ourselves. How many people have made mistakes that they regret? I actually want, put your hand up if you made a strike you deeply regret. Look around, look around. No, look, stop looking at me. I, I'm not the only one, right? Guess what? The guy who wrote this, do you know what he did before this? He cheered on the stoning of Stephen. He dragged people out of their house and killed them who followed Jesus. You think you got regret? You think you got some shame? When Paul calls himself greatest of sinner, it's not a turn of phrase. He devoted his life to try to serve and honor God to killing other followers of Jesus. I just need you to know that there's no height nor depth. That there's nothing we can do when we return to God that, that God won't use for good in this life or in the life to come. So Paul's going to go on here in verse 18 to list all the different circumstances that followers of Jesus in Corinth find themselves in. And he's going to button this up and send us on. Here's what he says. When was anyone, was anyone at the time of his call, that means the moment where they came to follow Jesus, circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Is that possible? No, are there things in this life that we can't fix, people? Yes. Ha there are unfixable and unmendable things in this life. Here's what he says next. He says, let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant? That means a slave when you were called. Do not be concerned about it. 
But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. But he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man in the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when he is called is a bondservant of Christ. You are bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. Paul's telling them, I just, does, does some of this stuff just not get fixed in this life, people? It just doesn't get better. Sometimes I'm going to tell you it doesn't even get easier. Sometimes it even gets harder and more painful. But Paul's telling them that you can't always change your circumstances in life. While there are some things you can change, there are others that won't. Your age, your past, so many other things. But the good news of Jesus today and every day is God is not limited by our circumstances our suffering, or our past. Listen to this. Instead, God uses every drop of our suffering, our circumstance, and past to bring his good news to the people around us in the present. The God squeezes every drop of suffering and hard circumstance and our past to bring his good news and his healing to the people around us in the present. It's not our perfection that the world needs, but the good news that in the midst of all circumstances, God can use us in wondrous and amazing ways. Please, please don't believe the lie that your circumstances have to become perfect for God to use you. Because guess what? It's a delusion that will never happen. The right time will never exist. Because even if it does around you, what will we do? We'll ruin it, like 100%. And I'm not saying there, I'm not saying there's not things that you and I need to turn away from and turn towards. Of course, repentance, it's the posture of a follower of Jesus. But what I am saying is that we can't put limitations on ourselves that Jesus does it. So, here's the good news for each of us today as we finish up. I'm going to ask you to grab your paper or grab your phone, make a note, whatever works. Um, And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to sit with this question for a little bit. And I want you to ask, what does it look like for me today to follow Jesus in the midst of my circumstances? What does it mean to put the laundry list of all the hard things in life and say, yes, I'm following you anyway? So I want you to take a moment and answer that. And when you finish, as we talk about what it means to follow to, to believe Jesus is good news, it always requires three things. It requires repentance first, to turning, there are some things in life we have to turn away from and there are things we need to turn towards. It requires us to believe, to trust Jesus, not ourselves. And it requires us to actually put the things we believe into action. So I'm gonna encourage you to take a little space and we'll in a few minutes move into a time of communion. But I want you to sit and write it out or make a note on your phone, text your spouse, I don't text a friend, I don't care what you do, do something. But I want you to put them down someplace because if it's just a nice passing thought, what will we do? Nothing. We know what that's like. So take some time and then we'll bring us back together in a few minutes.
three years ago, this weekend, Katie and I got on a plane and flew out to Manistee, Michigan. And we opened up Luke 5, and I challenged the people of God who called this place home to go a little deeper and to take a risk to follow Jesus. And church, as a community, have we taken some risks the last three years? Got some good and some bad news. We're just getting started. And in that passage in Luke 5, it ends with these words. Jesus says, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid, for now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Did Jesus say, hey, it's wrong to be afraid? Did he say, you should never be afraid? He said, in the midst of difficult circumstances, he said, come follow me. I've got a plan and a purpose, and you're part of it. I need you to know that whether you think it or not, you're an integral part of what God's doing in and through this place. And that our circumstance will never be perfect. And in the moment, we're not going to feel it always. But God beckons us to follow and to join him. So today, in the midst of whatever circumstance you find yourself in, Jesus invites you to this table. And we join with followers of Jesus for the last 2,000 years who have committed themselves when things were great and hard to following Jesus in all the places that he calls us to lead. And we take time and and we take the bread and we break it and remember that Christ's body was broken for us. And then we take a cup and we drink it to remember God's mercy and God's forgiveness who covered our sin. And I'm going to tell you, God doesn't welcome us to the table because we're perfect, does he, church? He welcomes us to the table because we've joined him on mission and he's forgiven us and we ask for mercy and he offered it freely. And for those of you today who are followers of Jesus and you've put your trust in him and have forsaken all others to follow him alone, this table's for you. Is this our table, church? No. Whose table is it? It's Christ's table and his table alone and all who he welcomes and calls to himself are welcome to come and feast. So as you're ready, worship team's gonna continue to play. We'll take some time and we'll, we'll serve communion together. So as you're ready, come forward to one of the two sides and we'll remember who Christ is and what he's done. And when you take that cup and when you eat that bread, know that you are qualified, not based on your perfection, but whose? But on Christ and Christ alone. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and be fed.